All right. Well, it looks like everyone has filtered into our virtual meeting space here who was in our waiting room. So um, I'd like to start with a, a very enthusiastic and warm welcome. Um, I am Julie Ziegler and I am Executive Director, CEO of Humanities Washington. Uh, welcome to Conflict and Compassion, Building Civic Love. This is a special event that we are putting on uh, for our donors and friends. Uh, so really wanna thank you all for your support, previous support of Humanities Washington. Uh, thanks for sticking with us through some challenging years for our communities. Um, we've kept going and certainly hope that we've inspired you all to do the same. Um, for closed captioning, I want to let folks know that you can click on the icon on the bottom right of your screen, and that should activate closed captioning if you need that for any accessibility um, reasons or concerns. So I, I want to also, before we get underway with our program today, you know, Humanities Washington is a statewide organization, and we want to recognize that in Washington state, uh, we stand on the ancestral homelands of 29 federally recognized Indian tribes and their people. We pay respect to their elders past and present, and we also want to acknowledge that every community owes its existence and vitality to generations from around the world of people from around the world who have contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy to making the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will, some were drawn to leave their distant homes in hope of a better life, and some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted truth and acknowledgement um, to very important values at Humanities Washington um, are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers, barriers of heritage and difference. So um, thank you all for being with us tonight um, to put those values into practice. Um, I am really pleased to introduce Craig Sims as the moderator for tonight's panel discussion. Craig is an accomplished lawyer with Schrader, Goldmark, and Bender. He has a passion for civility in the practice of law. Thank you, Craig, for leading the panel today and for what I know will be a fabulous discussion. I'll hand it over to you. Thanks. Hey, thank you, Julie, for the introduction, and also thank you for the invitation to be a part of this conversation. And thank you all in the virtual audience for sharing your time and space with us this evening. Through this conversation, we expect to carry forward Washington Humanities' aim in creating space for people to come together and explore and consider what it means to be human, to reflect upon our shared past, to be honest about our present, and inspire hope for our future. And this evening, we'll have a conversation about civility and its, important, its importance in all aspects of our lives. And we will accomplish these things by having a courageous conversation with our panelists this evening. And while we are having this conversation, I encourage each and every one of you in the virtual audience to write your questions or place comments in the Q&A real time. And I, as a moderator, will do my best to monitor it and incorporate them into the flow of conversations. Now let's get to it. Let's get to the introductions and meet our esteemed panel. So while their backgrounds have been provided in the pre-event materials, I'd like to give each of the panelists an opportunity to say a few words about themselves. And during their self-introduction, I'll ask them to define why does, this, why does civility, or strike that, what does civility mean to them and why is it important for our communities? And we'll do our introductions in alphabetical order. And so therefore we will start with Dr. Cornell Clayton. All right, I wasn't expecting to go first, but I will. Uh, thanks Craig and thanks uh, Julie and Shelly. Um, I'm really excited about the discussion tonight. Um, although when Shelly first asked me to participate, I was a bit skeptical. And the reason is, is because whenever I hear words like love and compassion as a way to fix our politics today, I'm reminded of that great uh, social psychologist, Mike Tyson, when he said, uh, everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face. 
And that's because our politics today often feels like we're getting punched in the face. It's so ugly and nasty and visceral. Uh, it's like every time we turn on the television, we're getting punched in the face by it. So I'm a political scientist by training. Uh, for the past 15 years, I've been the director of the Thomas S. Foley Institute at Washington State University. The institute was named after the former speaker of the House of Representatives. And one of our major focuses at the institute is civic education and civility. And back in 2010, we received a major grant from the NEH to host a conference on the relationship between civility and American democracy. And one of the things I took away from that conference is that um, we should really think about incivility uh, as a relative and contingent term. Uh, and really, we should think of it more as a consequence rather than a cause of dysfunction in our politics. You know, and since that time, I've done a lot of work on political polarization and the rise of populist politics. So I'm going to come at today's uh, discussion, I think, from a slightly different angle than maybe the other two panelists, rather than focusing on these individual character traits like civility or compassion or tolerance. I'm going to, uh, I want to say a little bit more about the institutional forces that drive our divisive and confrontational politics today. So hopefully that will be my contribution. All right, thank you, Dr. Clayton. And next up, Congressman Derek Kilmer. Thanks, Craig. I'm Derek Kilmer. I represent Washington State 6th District, which is most of Tacoma and then West, uh, the entire uh, Kitsap and Olympic Peninsulas. And for me, um, you know, I'm conscious of the fact that we have division that we feel pretty much everywhere from the content we see on our phones and on the news to uh, even conversations around the di dinner table and civility and civic bridge building to me focuses on bringing people together to understand other pers perspectives across lines of difference, um, while also reframing our sense of common purpose. It's important in my line of work because, listen, we have complicated issues that we need to deal with as a country. The, the seas are really rocky. And I'm a believer that the boat moves best when all oars are in the water rowing in the same direction. Uh, it's really hard right now because oftentimes it feels like 45% of the oars are rowing in one direction and 45% are rowing in the other direction and about 10% of the oars are out of the water beating everyone else in the boat over the heads. And that's why I think conversations like this are important because while we're not going to agree with each other on everything, we have to have the capacity to engage one another in a civil way with the hopes of finding a path forward. Thank you, Congressman Kilmer. And last but certainly not least, the amazing Amanda Ripley. Thank you, Craig. It's good to be here with you all tonight. I'm a journalist and an author. Uh, I had been a journalist for about 20 years when about maybe six years ago, I started to feel like uh, journalism was sort of broken. It just wasn't working the way it was supposed to work. Half the country didn't believe that the places I wrote for were telling the truth. Um, and the conflict, the political conflict was no longer behaving in a linear fashion. So it just didn't make sense. Um, so I stopped what I was doing and started following people and communities who've been stuck in really ugly conflicts of all kinds and who've shifted into a healthier kind of conflict. Um, because conflict is important. Conflict's how we challenge each other and get challenged. So the goal isn't no conflict, right? Any great story has conflict. Um, any, any strong organization, family, church has conflict. So the problem is high conflict or what's sometimes called intractable conflict where it takes on a life of its own and becomes conflict for conflict's sake and, and doesn't behave in ways that we're used to. Um, so everything we do tends to make it worse, <laughs> even when we're really trying to make it better. So um, as to the question of what is civility, to me, I tend to think a lot. I probably think too much about words, honestly. It's like a limited uh, there's limited power, but I do think a lot about words. And I like the word um, decency or dignity. That's a close cousin, maybe. But um, there's a book called The Decent Society 
by Avishai Margalit. And um, there's a quote in there that a decent society is one whose institutions do not humiliate the people under their authority and whose citizens do not humiliate each other. So that feels like a, a good goal. It's not a high bar, admittedly, <laughs> but it feels like that's what we need in order to have healthy conflict. Thank you. And, and Representative Kilmer, when we uh, were doing our uh, pre-call before we logged in to let the greater audience into this, uh, this conversation, it was my understanding that something you said served as inspiration for having this conversation today. And I believe it was something you may have said in, the, in some prior uh, conversation, a prior event. Tell us why it is that you thought this conversation was important today. So, you know, unfortunately, we've seen a number of instances of, of conflict in my neck of the woods. Uh, sadly, last fall, there were a number of attacks on religious institutions in Tacoma. We saw uh, the Islamic Center uh, burned to the ground by an arsonist. We saw vandalism against a synagogue and a church. There was a um, attack on uh, two Buddhist faith leaders outside their temple. And uh, in the, um, in, I guess in an example of something good coming out of something bad, there was an interfaith alliance that formed to provide mutual support to the faith community. And um, basically to share the message that part of living in a religiously diverse pluralistic democracy demands that we live next to people who think and look and pray differently than we do without it coming to conflict. Mm -hmm. And uh, in December, I visited a YMCA in my district where I thought we were going to talk about the fact that gyms were losing money during the pandemic. That's not what they wanted to talk about. They wanted to talk about the fact that they literally had fights break out over pick your red or blue issue the people who literally shown up to work out at a Y had gotten into arguments and, and gotten into fisticuffs uh, because we, they couldn't agree on politics. And in that instance, we also saw something good out of, come out of something bad. That, that community said, you know, we, we, we're not going to ignore this problem. And so that Y actually hired a consultant that's training their staff and training their board in conflict resolution and trying to foster civil discourse so that um, people listen to each other. And rather than settling disputes through shouting matches and fist fights. And I think, you know, we need to um, recognize that uh, we're not going to agree with each other on everything as a country, but we've got to figure out how to peacefully coexist and navigate some really complex issues as a country. And that's something that I've been working on. We actually introduced some legislation called the Bridging Civic Bridges Act that's focusing on addressing conflict and division uh, and supporting efforts, including some of these hyper-local efforts, whether it be at the YMCA or uh, whether it be religious institutions that are trying to get people to engage one another across their lines of difference. And I have concerns about conflicts like these because it's clear that the vitriol and division that we see in politics is directly impacting our communities. And so I shared that in a meeting with Humanities Washington and I guess um, sparked some interest in the topic more broadly. Thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you for serving as the inspiration being part of this conversation. And one of the things that drew me to want to be a part of this conversation as well is because uh, about 28 and a half years ago, my oldest son was born and I was told in a leadership conference that I needed to adopt a motto for my life that I follow and have it serve as my North Star in both my personal and professional decisions. And the motto is, was and it still is, I'm preparing my children for the world while preparing the world for my children. And what that means to me is while I'm in my home, I need to ensure that my uh, children are as great a community members as they can be, but also when I cross the threshold in the community, I need to make sure that the world is the greatest place for them as it can be. And it, it needs to start with these types of, of courageous and honest conversations. And as we are talking about civility today, 
you know, my spirit compels me to acknowledge the most recent mass shootings in Buffalo, New York of last week, uh, in Uvalde, uh, Texas earlier today. And, and it's clear uh, at this point, and frankly, it's been very clear before this time that people of goodwill are no longer in a position to remain quiet and idle on these issues because it's real. And how do we at least in, first engage in conversation where it's authentic conversation about some of these issues? Because frankly, I'm scared. I'm scared about some of these things and the level of violence that uh, is starting to rise. And it seems like it's coming closer and closer to my doorstep. And as we're having these conversations, um, and I think about and was having conversations with a friend of mine the other day, just about my own personal fear as a black man in this community, in this country with a Juris Doctor degree. And I have a fear now of going to a religious institution, going to a mall where there may be other people that look like me thinking that I may be a sitting target, right? And so I, I bring all that to, to open up having authentic conversation and to really dig into the question. And I'll start with Representative Kilmer. Uh, were these the type of conflicts that even you were considering or thought that would have ever been a, something we need to be concerned about in either our local or global communities? And then I'll go to uh, Amanda Ripley. Well, yes. Um, you know, unfortunately, we've seen, I, I've been a member of Congress for, this is my 10th year. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I cannot count how many moments of silence I've participated in following mass shootings in this country, far too many. And frankly, there've been far too many moments of action. And, you know, I, I, my response to this is not just as a representative, uh, it's as a dad, you know, I dropped my kids off at school this morning. And when I drop my kids off, I want them to be excited about the day ahead, not fearful for their safety. You know, people should be able to go to school without having to, you know, I still remember the worst day I've had well, actually second worst now after January 6th, but, you know, the worst, the second worst day I've had in this job was calling home one night when my youngest child was uh, in the first grade. And I said, how was school today? And they said, we had a special fire drill today. And I said, what's a special fire drill? And they said, well, we had to hide in the coat closet and put coats over ourselves and be really still and really quiet. It was an active shooter drill. And I just don't think we should take that as, well, that's just life in America. Um, now, the reality is we've seen a little bit of bipartisanship on some of these issues. There was a bill that uh, I led the charge on. I was one of the leaders of the charge on called the Stop School Violence Act, which actually did get bipartisan support. There's a bill that has passed the House called the Bipartisan Background Checks Act. It's somewhat misnamed because by bipartisan, it was a handful of Republicans and then all of the Democrats in support of universal background checks, something that our state and its voters have already embraced. You know, you've seen some efforts to close the Charleston loophole, which, and you mentioned faith communities where um, the inability to have a adequate background check, check system led to a mass shooting at a uh, Emanuel uh, African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina, that led to the murder of nine innocent people. And this is one of those areas where um, I, 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 I wish I was confident that, you know, we could get past our ideological sort of um, camps and figure out a path forward. Uh, I, I remain hopeful that we can. I, I'm not, not willing to accept that we can't because none of us should accept this is just a fact of life in America. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll continue to engage in a constructive and respectful conversation. I will be candid with you. I've had some of these tough conversations with my Republican colleagues, again, not just as a representative, but as a dad and said, well, what I know I'm not gonna get everything I want on these issues, but what can we agree to that might help us move forward to prevent this type of tragedy? Because we cannot keep just having this happen. Thank you. Uh, Amanda, any follow-up or other thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think, 
Derek, I appreciate what you said about how one of our biggest threats, and there are many right now, is a, a fu futility, like a sense of hopelessness, right? Like a sense that it, ha it's gonna, it has to be this way. Um, and so it's an interesting catch-22, right? Like we, we know that this keeps happening um, and it's heartbreaking and it's terrifying. Um, and Craig, yeah, I, I, I'm grateful that you opened us with stating that it is frightening. It is frightening. And, um, and it shouldn't be this way. This country could do better than this. Um, I think one of the foundational problems we've got is deep, deep distrust of each other, right? And until we really focus on that, it's a, it's a self-perpetuating pathology, right? So we know that just to kind of contextualize what's going on here in the sort of bigger picture, right? We know that um, the United States murder rate skyrocketed by nearly 30% in 2020, which is the highest recorded one-year increase in modern American history. No other country that we know of has seen this kind of spike even though everyone was dealing obviously with the pandemic, many, many places with far fewer government resources um, than we had. And interestingly, no area was spared. It's big cities, small cities, rural parts of the country. Um, and, you know, there are different theories about what is causing this, but the three leading explanations that most experts agree on for this recent spike is the interaction of the pandemic policing. So in some ways, um, it was a, a deep decline in trust for the police, which was already very low. And that always tends to lead to an increase in homicide when people feel like institutions are corrupt, right? They take justice into their own hands. They don't report things. It's a, again, a sort of negative feedback loop. Um, and uh, anytime there's a wedge between police and the communities they serve, violence flourishes, right? And then the third thing is guns. So one of the fairly unique things about the United States is that the state doesn't have a monopoly on the use of force. And we saw massive increase in gun buying uh, during the pandemic, a lot of first time gun buyers and those legally purchased guns were moving into illegal hands much more quickly than in the past, so within six months. So I'm saying all of this not to further depress us, um, but to say that if you think about all those interacting effects, right, we have to work on gun regulations, which still 53% of Americans support tightening gun regulations. And, and I know that Derek and his colleagues um, are trying to do that. So that has to continue. Another thing is we have got to work on rebuilding relationships between police and the communities they serve. Um, so there's lots of evidence of places that have done that, not just around the world, but in the US. So that is something we know we, we can do and it is possible, it's not easy, right? Um, but there's a lot of reason to believe that it does not have to be this way. Thank you, Ms. Ripley. And Dr. Clayton, uh, as Representative Kilmer and Ms. Ripley gave their responses, it was clear to me that the root, or at least a good portion of the root of some of the issues related to civility revolve and evolve around institutions, uh, whether it be you know, governmental institutions, but perhaps um, legislative or the court system, and even maybe even in the media as an institution. So as you are here to focus on the institution, what do you think the, the role of whatever institution you choose, if you can identify one and kind of dig into the role that one specific institution plays into civility or lack thereof in our local or global community? Well, you know, I, you know before I came onto the uh, Zoom here, I, uh, I was listening to the president's address uh, about the, the shooting down in Texas. 
And then you know, I, I normally do, I flip back and forth between CNN and Fox News to see how both sides are characterizing the event. And they've already fallen back into the usual patterns where uh, you know, uh, the President Biden and CNN talk about the gun lobby, uh, keeping us from having sensible gun control. And uh, on Fox News, they're talking about um, you know, the evil actions of individuals and uh, mental health problems. And so we're back into that same conversation we've been hearing for the last 20, 30 years. Um, here's the remarkable thing to me. Um, if you look at uh, public opinion data on gun control, on, on, on sensible gun regulation, like uh, universal background checks, uh, limiting magazine capacity, uh, limiting uh, ability to purchase um, uh, assault weapons, there's really overwhelming sentiment to, that supports those, uh, even, um, even among conservatives and, and self-identified um, Republicans. So the question is, why can't we get legislation passed? And here you meet the problem of, of institutional dysfunction. We have institutional dysfunction in our parties right now. And there's a reason why we're having that, that dysfunction. And there's ways that we can start to address that dysfunction. But until we focus on the institutional nature of these problems, rather than focusing on individuals and individual traits, you know, I'm sure if you ask uh, Congressman uh, Kilmer, when he talks to his Republican colleagues about uh, things like Sandy Hook or this shooting that just happened in Texas, I I'm sure he, they're very compassionate, just as compassionate and sympathetic as he is about what's going on. It's not that people lack compassion. It's not that they're uncivil. It's that we have institutional incentives right now that's, uh, that are incentivizing confrontational politics and zero sum politics. And so, I mean, I, I, you know, we can talk about that later, I guess. Um, I mean, it, political parties are at the, at the heart of that, uh, but it's the way our parties right now have divided themselves that's created the problems. And so we can talk about that later if you'd like. Yeah, let, let's keep going with that. Uh, because one of the things that I see, and it's obvious to those who are seeing me on camera, I am a black man, uh, 49 years on this earth. And the way things have shaped and evolved for me, particularly over the past six years or so, is that uh, political party means something to me as it relates to race. And I'm not here to talk about politics and dig into my personal politics, but I think myself and many others in, in, in the community see it that way. And that if you uh, talk about Republican ideology, then you are viewed in, in a certain way. And it's, it's black and white, pun intended, uh, or maybe it wasn't intended, I'm not that quick. Uh, but it, it is something like, it's very black and white. And as I look at one of the comments uh, that, that's here in the Q&A, the, the issue that, that's raised is essentially why is it that we have a we don't have the ability to simply separate the ideas from the individual, right? And so let's let's dig into that. And I'll follow up with you, uh, Dr. Clayton. So I think it's really important to distinguish between uh, what motivates and hence how we can fix mm -hmm. individual level behavior from mass level political behavior. At the mass level the underlying drivers of political polarization in our country and conflict today are not that different than we've had in the past. It's primarily race, it's religion, and it's geography. Increasingly, there are two Americas. There is one that's urban, cosmopolitan, and secular, another that's rural, white, and devoutly religious. And by almost every measure, the attitudes and values of the former have been winning over the last several decades. And this has created a backlash uh, amongst those on the right who see these trends as an existential threat to their way of life. What's important, I think, to understand, however, is that these issues, race, religion, geography, have always divided Americans. What is different today, like in a few previous periods in our history, is that our political parties have sorted along these dimensions so that these issues have become the primary cleavages in our partisan politics. Now, when that happens and our parties are closely divided, neither one dominates, it changes the logic of our political institutions. 
The incentive for parties is no longer to de-escalate these divisions, but rather to intensify and heighten those divisions. Rather than using civility and moderation to appeal to the median voter, our campaigns become about base strategies aimed at demonizing the opposition, stoking fear and emphasizing these red meat issues. And that I think is the cycle of polarization and confrontational politics that we find ourselves in today. Thank you. And Representative Kilmer, as it's gonna be you know, necessary for you to be effective in your job to work with people on the opposite side of the aisle as you. So how do you have the ability to do that, you know, recognizing the, the foundation that Dr. Clayton just laid for us in terms of the, the history of politics? How do we then have the ability to have those conversations with someone that may, may be politically ideology, uh, may be different than ours? It's a mixed bag, Craig. Gotcha. Um, you know, I, I still remember my first week in Congress we had a group that went to the um, Pentagon. I was on the Armed Services Committee and they had all the freshman members, the new members of the Armed Services Committee and the Foreign Affairs Committee go to the Pentagon and meet with the Secretary of Defense and the Joint Chiefs. And then we took a bus back to the Capitol and it was like seven o'clock at night. So I stood up on the bus. It was my first week on the job. I stood up on the bus as the bus rolled into the Capitol and said, hey, I'm gonna go grab a burger if anybody wants to come. Cause I was like, it's my first week on the job. I'm gonna try to get to know people, right? So we had three Democrats and three Republicans go up to this burger joint on Pennsylvania Avenue. Good stuff burgers, delicious milkshakes. And we're sitting there talking, you know, what was your race like and how did you get here and things like that. And, you know, about 45 minutes into the, dinner, I said something along the lines of, you know, it seems like we ought to be able to make some progress on at least some of this stuff. And the guy sitting across the table from me was a Republican from the Midwest. And he said, Derek, I like you. And he, he, in fact, his parents used to live in my district. And he said, in fact, I called my parents after our freshman orientation and said, you know, you, you seem to be represented by what seems to be a pretty good guy. And I said, well, thank you for that. And he said, now here's what you don't understand. He said, I won my seat by defeating a Republican incumbent. And I, I ran against him as not being conservative enough. He said, the first vote I cast when I got to Congress was a vote against John Boehner for Speaker of the House. And he said, and I sent out a press release after that vote saying I voted against him because he's too compromising, too willing to work with Democrats. And he said, Derek, here's what you don't get. I like you, but my constituents didn't send me here to work with you. They sent me here to stop you. And I walked out of that burger joint and I called up my wife and I said, I have two reactions to this. One, how incredibly honest and forthcoming. And two, oh my God, right? Like this is a real problem. And here's what I will tell you though, Craig. So there is a good chunk of folks who've come to Congress with that perspective of, I'm not here to work with other people. That, that makes it challenging, right? There's an unfortunately decent sized percentage of that. There's a decent, percentage that are absolutely people who are there with an eye toward not contributing to the partisan bickering, but wanting to see stuff get done, even if it means they don't get all the stuff that they want. And then there's a pretty good chunk in this sort of third category that it just depends on the issue, where you can find common ground on this issue or that issue, but there's some things where it's just going to be a, you know, there, that there's no common ground to be had. And, you know, this gets at something I've, you know, I've had the opportunity to both read Amanda's book and, and hear her speak uh, in front of a few groups, you know, I, and including one that I lead, the Bipartisan Working Group, which is a group of a dozen Democrats and a dozen Republicans who meet for breakfast every week. And listen, I will tell you this, Craig, there are members of that group that I disagree with a whole lot. But what we've tried to do is figure out how do we talk to each other and listen to each other and figure out where we might be able to find some common ground, at least on a few things? I think part of the reason that, according to recent polling, Congress is held in lower regard than head lice, colonoscopies, and the rock band Nickelback is because the American public is righteously frustrated that we can't even move forward on the fix upon which there is agreement. And so part of the work that we're trying to do is at least figure out where is at least there's some shaded area in the Venn diagram and figure out where we might be able to move forward on at least those things. 
Uh, thank you for that. And while I can't come to the defense of lice, I surely want to defend Nickelback. Because uh, I listened to Nickelback back in the day, so they're okay. Uh, so I have to at least, you know, protect them a little bit. Um, Ms. Ripley, so from uh, the remarks from Dr. Clayton and Representative Kilmer, there were, both of them remarked upon the role of the media. And Dr. Clayton, and even today, flipping back in terms of the pundits on CNN and Fox News and uh, Representative Kilmer also talking about the media. And I know that, and he also gave you a shout out in terms of your book, so I definitely want you to, to talk about that a bit. But, you know, I know in doing some of the research and preparation for this conversation that you have done some writing on how journalists could do a better job in covering controversy in the age of outrage. And to me, if, if, if you look at some of the, uh, the news broadcasts and journalists, they are stoking the fire and doing nothing but inflaming. And so I'm curious, that's just my perspective. And there are many that are doing the exact opposite. Uh, I'm curious, how do you see the role of media as it relates to either inflaming incivility or supporting the cause of civility as it relates to political um, conversation? Yeah, so in every high conflict or intractable conflict I've looked at all around the world, whether it's a political conflict or uh, gang violence or even a really toxic divorce conflict. There, there are always a few things present, a few conditions that created that kind of malignant conflict. And one of the most reliable uh, triggers is the presence of conflict entrepreneurs. So these are people or platforms who are exploiting conflict for their own ends. Um, we all can be conflict entrepreneurs. Like I wake up every day and I'm like, just don't be a conflict entrepreneur today. <laughs> Especially in a culture where we've designed a bunch of our institutions, including politics, including journalism, including Twitter, to incentivize and reward conflict entrepreneurship, right? So this is, um, this is a problem we have created, we humans, right? Not all of us, but we are in this system now and we could easily, easily design systems, especially social media platforms that uh, incentivize conflict interrupters. People like Derek Kilmer. There are people all over this country who are every day slogging it out, resisting the temptation to be a conflict entrepreneur and it is lonely. I mean, I don't know. I don't want to speak for Derek, but I will say as a journalist trying to resist this culture of, of high conflict, it has been very lonely at times Like, because you are sort of not part of your group. You know, like we are wired to want to be in our group, whatever that is, and to want to feel like we are part of something and someone has our back, especially in times of conflict. So if you resist the forces of your group that are turning to contempt or dehumanization or demonization, it is lonely. And so the more people who can do that, the more people who can acknowledge that, who can uh, reward that, the more likely it is to continue. But there are these conflict entrepreneurs, like you said, Craig, on pundits, certainly we see many of them, Tucker Carlson, Donald Trump, uh, they're, they're sort of louder on the right right now, but there are lots of conflict entrepreneurs on the left. I think we all can think of some. Um, usually conflict entrepreneurs are themselves, especially ones who've made a career out of it, usually they are damaged in some way right? Like they have gone through something and they have not dealt with it or have not been able to deal with it. And having spent time with people who once were conflict entrepreneurs and are not anymore, I try not to give up on them totally, but it's hard. I do think it's important to distance yourself from conflict entrepreneurs, whether they're in your social media feed, whether they're on your TV, whether they're in your life, right? Um, but that is something we all could do today, right, is we could recognize who are the conflict entrepreneurs in my orbit, in my newsfeed, in politics, and who, who is actively working against those forces. I was talking just very quickly to a politician the other day, and she said to me, you know, my team just wants me to be angrier all the time because we could raise so much more money. <laughs> um, and she wants to get things done. 
and she is angry. She is angry and she's often right to be angry. Angry is, angry is okay. Angry can be energizing, right? Because anger suggests you want the other person to be better than they are. Contempt is much harder to work with and that's what she's trying to resist, right? But that takes a lot of strength, takes a lot of um, spiritual and emotional support. So the more we can do, when we see someone out there resist their party or the forces of contempt in journalism, on Fox News, whatever, it's really important to send them a note to do what you can to support them because it is really hard to do that. And I was going to ask that follow-up question as well uh, to change the energy a bit. And I'm going to uh, transition to Representative Kilmer. So, you know, the, the conflict interrupters, and I appreciate those terms, conflict uh, entrepreneurs and conflict interrupters. And so for the conflict interrupters, uh, you know, Ms. Ripley talked about it being lonely. And sometimes it's, it's draining and you just want to stop. Why do you put yourself through this cycle? Uh, because it's exhausting. And it seems like you're, you know, tossing a cup of water at a windmill. And so Representative Kilmer, what is it that keeps you to keep keep moving forward, knowing sort of the obstacles that you are surely to face each and every day when you uh, represent your, your community. And I think that what you have to share, uh, no pressure, but pressure intended, I think will be impactful on a lot of us, including myself, in terms of how do we, if we know that you can do it, and these are the tools that, uh, that you engage in to keep moving forward, we too can do it. So Representative Kilmer. Well, Maybe let me say a little bit about why this matters. Sure. I'll, you know, I, um, earlier this year, I was in a meeting. It was a three-hour a, a, a three meeting where there was a presentation by um, uh, uh, experts looking at um, everything from messaging to political communications, you name it. And at the beginning of the day, there was a poll reference from NBC News. NBC News did a poll that found that 70% of Americans think we are incapable as a country of solving big problems anymore because we're so divided. In other words, you know, that loss of trust that Amanda just spoke to um, is manifested in the inability to get things done. And that should stir each of us. The other poll that was referenced was a battleground poll. They ask uh, on a scale of zero to 100, with zero being no conflict and 100 being civil war. They asked Americans where they put our country right now. And the number was 70, which is the highest on record. And that should be concerning to all of us that on the average Americans think we're more than two thirds of the way to civil war, right? That, that should be that should be a alarm bell for each of us. And it's why, you know, I mentioned this Building Civic Bridges Act that I've introduced, which is really designed to support these efforts at the local level, these, you know, hyper local efforts to actually just bridge some of the divisions that we see, that that to 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 spur, not not to agree on everything, not to hold hands and sing kumbaya around the table, but to say, Part of living in a, in a healthy democracy is the ability to engage on our differences um, rather than have, having every interaction turn into the Jerry Springer show. You know, the other thing, and, and uh, Amanda actually testified in front of a committee that I chair called the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress, which makes us sound like we're the IT help desk, but we've been nicknamed the Fixed Congress Committee which usually gets people either to giggle or to offer to pray for me, um, which I appreciate by the way. But, um, you know, so in that committee, the history of these select committees, the, the hit rate, the success rate of these select committees is terrible. More often than not, they get nothing done. If you look at modern history, most of these select committees have passed zero recommendations. And so, you know, Amanda used the phrase conflict disruptors. When, when I became chair of this committee, one of the things I said to my Republican counterpart was, if we want Congress to work differently, why don't we do things differently? 
So when you become chair of a committee, the first thing that happens is you get your budget for the committee. And then easy math happens. Half the money goes to the Democrats and half the money goes to the Republicans. Democrats use their half to hire people with a Democratic background who put on blue jerseys. And the Republicans use their half of the money to hire people with a Republican background who put on red jerseys. And then they spend the rest of the time fighting with each other. So I approached my Republican counterpart and said, hey, crazy idea. What if we don't do that? What if we just hire one staff? And some of them will be Democrats and some of them will be Republicans, but they'll all put on jerseys that say, hey, let's fix Congress. And to his credit, he said, sure, I'm game. Let's, let's give it a shot. We also, if you watch one of our hearings on C-SPAN, you probably have too much time on your hands. But if you watch one of our hearings on C-SPAN, you'll notice something. One, we don't sit with Democrats on one side of the dais and Repo Republicans on the other side of the dais. Why? Well, my genetic predisposition, when I hear an amazing witness like Amanda Ripley say something in interesting, I lean over to the person next to me and say, hey, that was kind of interesting. What do you think of that? And on our committee, you're leaning over next to someone from a different party. We don't even sit on a dais. We sit around a round table. Why? Well, I have never had a good conversation speaking to the back of somebody's head. So we are trying to just do things differently. So why do I mention that? These changes, these sort of operational differences that we've undertaken are not cosmetic. We have managed to now pass more than 140 bipartisan recommendations for reform in Congress. About two thirds of them have either been implemented or are on the path toward implementation. And so I share that with you just to give you a sense of that's why it matters to try to disrupt the conflict because if you look at most committees in Congress, it's just the Hatfields and McCoys on opposite sides of the gymnasium throwing flaming bags of dog poop at each other. And that is not a way to move our country forward. Thank you, Representative Kilmer. Um, and I will neither confirm nor deny whether I've seen your hearings on C-SPAN. Um, Dr. Clayton, so as we've been talking about these institutions and as uh, Representative Kilmer has been talking about some of the solutions that he's seeking to, to bring forth, to bring civility back to politics. Uh, some people, not myself, but some people that may be watching this or will watch this in the future may be skeptical that it is not possible based on what I see to really uh, find solutions within our government institutions. How would you respond to that? Yeah, you know, so it's, it's interesting. Um, back in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, we actually thought uh, that our partisan politics was too cozy. We were too bipartisan. In fact, the American Political Science Association came out with a major report entitled uh, Towards Re Responsible Party Government, in which they said um, the, 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 problem, the, you know, the problem we had in our politics was our parties were controlled by people with similar social backgrounds, and they agreed on almost every major policy issue. And that's a problem for democracy because democracy requires real choices. Uh, and, re and real alternatives to, to, to offer to voters. So during the 1970s, there were a number of reforms undertaken to actually sharpen the divide between our parties. There were reforms like moving from caucuses to primaries to select candidates and reforms in the leadership of Congress to empower, uh, to, you know, to, to uh, remove or de-emphasize seniority and empower younger, less moderate members of Congress. Those reforms have worked relatively well. Today, we have real choices between the parties. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing from a democratic standpoint. You want people to have real choices. Uh, the problem is the conflict is, all, is also being channeled in some dysfunctional and anti-democratic ways. And, and that needs to be addressed. And it can be addressed. There's lots of solutions out there. Um, and I'll just, you know, there, just to name a few of them, for instance, you know, you can reduce the power of extremists in both parties by getting rid of uh, closed primaries and replacing them with open primaries and going to a ranked choice voting in the general election. Okay, okay. For someone who may not be familiar, can you explain what closed primary means? Yeah, closed primary means that only Republicans get a vote for Republican candidates in the primary and Democrats for Democratic candidates. And what that does is that tends to lead to the to um, more moderate members being primaried by people on the extremes. And, and it's much easier to capture than the party uh, when you have a closed primary system. Um, I just experienced that here in Idaho, for instance, uh, and then this last election. 
Um, and, and, and we can do this. We can change our, the, the way we run our elections so we produce more moderate uh, uh, candidates who have to appeal to a much broader base uh, of voters uh, without constitutional amendment, without even federal laws. Uh, individual states can do this. In fact, they've already started doing it. Alaska and Maine are experimenting with ranked choice voting systems. Uh, we can depoliticize uh, our election administration by requiring uh, nonpartisan redistricting commissions and by making sure that all of our state and local officials are nonpartisan, elected to nonpartisan offices. Uh, we can depoliticize the Supreme Court by appointing justices to fixed terms of office uh, and, and ensuring that each president has the same number of appointments uh, in each term. We can also change the way social media uh, works and some of the dysfunctions there. For instance, um, one of the things we can do is require uh, that people identify themselves before they make posts, and that would do away with the role that bots and AI play in, in, uh, in spreading false and inflammatory posts. We can dramatically cut down the spread of inflammatory posts by simply modifying or getting rid of a share button on, on social media platforms like, uh, like uh, Facebook and Twitter. And, and People can still share stuff, they just have to cut and paste it and individually do it rather than all of a sudden press one button and it goes out to a thousand contacts. That's how you get this viral spread. Uh, you know, we, there's all sorts of other ways we could regulate. We can regulate uh, the, the algorithms that media, uh, social media companies use or at least make them publicize those algorithms so we can get at the spread of, of false and, and uh, inflammatory information. But the point is we have to think about these solutions at the institutional level. Um, you know, there's really no evidence that Americans have become less civil or less compassionate in the past. Remember, we're a country that had slavery and a civil war where we killed 2% of our population, horribly discriminated against gays and Chinese Americans and Catholics and Jews and all sorts of other people uh, for years. If anything, we're, we're more compassionate and more accepting of diversity in America today as individuals than ever probably in our history. The problem is our institutions are, are, and, and they're channeling conflict in dysfunctional ways. Um, you know, we've had periods of history in the past where we've made important institutional changes to modify our politics. I think about the wake of the Civil War. I think about the Progressive Era. I think about the New Deal period. Uh, again, the 1970s, which I just talked about. And, and uh, all these were quite successful. If we were looking for a model for institutional change, I would point to the progressive era. That was a period when our parties were, were polarized, they were internally divided, um, and yet they passed things like the 17th Amendment leading to the direct election of the Senate, the 19th Amendment, the in, uh, empowerment of women. Uh, they fundamentally transformed civil service, depoliticizing it. All those things were accomplished during a deeply divided period in our, our political history. And we can do that again. The point is we have to make it the focus of our attention. Got it. Thank you, Dr. Clayton. And we are nearing the end of our time here, but there are a couple of questions I want to address it. So I'd ask those in the audience if they could uh, grant us five additional minutes of their time. And I want to turn to uh, Ms. Ripley. And I want to, again, we're, we're solution oriented now. We're shifting the conversation. Uh, and the question that was posed is how do we promote the advantages of being conflict interrupters to people? So if that is our aim, how is it that we can make the case and give people the tools to be uh, conflict interrupters? Ms. Ripley. Yes, so I love this question. Um, one of the things we know from all the research on psychology in conflict is that um, people are more likely to leave high conflict when you light up their other identities. So we want to try to appeal to people. Everyone is more than one thing, right? All of us are more than one thing. Um, usually the most effective way to do this at scale is to appeal to people's identity as a parent or as a child of somebody, right? So family. Um, everybody shares, it's most people on some level, that identity, and everybody cares about kids and about the future. So there are, there are some things that we know from the research are a good way to try to light up the other identities outside of partisan identities. And the good news is most Americans want 
desperately want something different from politics, from journalism, from social media. They are exhausted, they are demoralized, they are frustrated. So it's a small number of people and who are really driving this incivility. Um, but it doesn't take many, honestly. If you look at the history of violent political conflict, it, it only takes a small number of people. The fastest way to lose a democracy is through violence. So when I train journalists these days, I talk a lot about how can journalists work to prevent or at least reduce retaliatory violence in the lead up to the midterms, right? So that's kind of first order, um, is how can we mitigate for the violence that is probably going to come, particularly before and after the midterms. In, in addition to that, one thing I would say is that there are people and organizations all over this country trying to do these things, trying to raise up conflict interrupters, right? Um, at the local level, at the national level, um, Election SOS is a great one for training journalists. Braver Angels, some of you may have heard of, they have chapters all over the country for helping people talk across our political divide. Everyone can join this. You can join virtually, you can go in person. Uh, the Trusting News Organization is another one for, for you know, rebuilding trust with journalism. Uh, so I, I would re really encourage people to not stand by and cede the arena to extremists because they will take over if, if we let them. I'll put some links in the chat if, if anyone's interested in, in those organizations I mentioned. Perfect, thank you for that. And just for those folks who may not uh, have access to the chat right now, electionsos.com braverangels.org and trustingnews.org. Thanks, Craig. Thank you. And so as we begin to close our conversation today, we've talked about a number of different things. And I think we had a pretty deep and rich conversation uh, in, our, in our 60 minutes together. And now what I'd like to do is provide each panelist with an opportunity to do just the final closing remark, short closing remark, and provide words of inspiration in terms of moving forward uh, so that when we leave this conversation, we'll recognize that we're in challenging times, but we can still have hope and we should still have hope. And so I'll start with Representative Kilmer. Well, I appreciate how you asked that. Um, I had a friend give me a quote uh, right before the pandemic began from Rabbi Jonathan Sachs because I used to describe myself as genetically optimistic. And they gave me this quote and said, stop calling yourself an optimist because um, what Rabbi Sachs said was there's a difference between optimism and hope. He said, optimism is a passive virtue. It's the belief that things will get better. He said, hope is an active virtue. It's the belief that together we can make things better. He said, it doesn't take courage to have optimism but it does take courage to hope. And so I appreciate they asked that question <laughs> around uh, the notion of hope, because we have agency. Each of us can do something about this. When we sit down with someone with whom we disagree, when we walk into a conversation with the understanding that we may not be right about everything, um, and that the other person may have some facts on their side, when we listen and when we try to understand where someone else is coming from, you know, where I get hope is from the interfaith group in Tacoma that said, you know what, we're not going to let violence and, and vandalism and assault define who we are, but rather we're going to say that we are more united than that. And that part of our role is to say, hey, no matter how you pray, we're going to have your back. Where I get hope is from my local YMCA who said, we're not just going to accept that people are going to show up and work out and get into fist fights with each other, but that there's a better way and that we're gonna actually host people to come together and talk to each other and listen to each other and try, even though if we're, we're not gonna agree on everything, but try to find a way um, to come together across our differences. And that's you know really the rationale behind this bill that I've introduced to support efforts like that, literally to provide federal support for efforts like that, which by the way, we do in other countries. We do through the National Endowment for Democracy support efforts to build social cohesion and, and foster civic bridge building as a means of strengthening democracy in other countries, but we don't do that domestically. 
um, I find hope from meeting with groups like Braver Angels, as, as Amanda just said, and from people who are asking, what do I do? You know, how do, recognizing that, as President Kennedy said, in a democracy, we all hold office. And the office that we hold is as citizen to engage and to figure out a better way. And so um, I hope that might spur those who are watching or listening um, to ask the question, what do I do? Uh, how can I engage in a way to make things better? Because I think um, there are a lot of people who are putting their oar in the water uh, and, uh, and that's how we write the ship. So thanks again, Craig. Yeah, thank you, Representative Kilmer. Dr. Clayton. Yeah, thanks, Craig. And I really appreciate what Representative Kilmer said. Because while I've talked a lot about institutions, uh, I do think that individual character traits of leaders is, are extremely important. They, you know, leaders are, are political elites. They shape our institutions. They shape public opinion. And I think the most important trait they can have is hope and, and realistic optimism. Uh, and the reason is, is because the quickest way, the surest way to Manichaean thinking, to turning Americans against each other, is to uh, embrace declinism, this idea that things are getting worse and that politics is a zero sum game, that, that, that uh, the gains of some can only come at the expense of others. And, and so uh, I, I find this is a constant battle because I think there's this declinist narrative on both the left and the right today. They have different reasons why things are getting worse and worse. Um, but uh, we have to constantly fight. I fight this with my students all the time. You know, I tell them, and of course they think I'm a hundred years old, but I tell them, you know, just think about the progress in my lifetime. You know, when I was born in a, in a third of the states in this country, you couldn't marry somebody of a different race, let alone somebody of the same sex. You know, when I was born, women in this country couldn't apply for credit in their own name. They couldn't pursue careers in medicine, law, other major professions. Sandra Day O'Connor, graduate top of her class from Stanford, had to take a job as a legal secretary because nobody would hire her as a lawyer. In 1960, the average American lifespan was a decade shorter than it is today. Uh, family poverty level was double what it is today. The number of people with, with a high school degree has doubled in that time. Um, I can go on and on. You know, our air and water is cleaner. We've saved endangered species. That's not to say we don't have real challenges. We have significant challenges around race, around, around the uh, climate change. But um, there's really never been a better time than right now to be an American. More people live longer, happier, safer, more just lives with more opportunities than any time in our history. And so without being Pollyannish, without downplaying the real challenges we face today, I think it's important to have that hope and that perspective that history provides and to pass that hope on to the next generation so that they see politics as a uh, see it as a promise and not, not something to be despairing about. And that they see that other people are their allies and, and not their enemies in building a, a better America and a better life. So I agree with, with the representative. Hope is, hope is the most important characteristic. All right, thank you, Dr. Clayton. Uh, Ms. Ripley. Yeah, I mean, I wanna um, follow up on that by, by pointing out, and I remind myself of this too, I mean, it is easy to really despair, you know, but um, the, earlier in this conversation, I rattled off a bunch of harrowing statistics about the increase in the murder rate. So I should also have said that despite that terrible increase, it is nowhere near as bad as it was when I was a kid in the 80s in New Jersey, or when I lived in Washington, DC, where I live now in the 90s. It is nowhere near as bad as it was. Um, so we had to take a long view. It's very hard to do. But I have huge confidence in the creative energy and community spirit of most Americans. Not all, but most, right? Uh, this country is a country of people who join, who believe, who are hopeful when there is no good reason to be. Um, and it reminds me very quickly of one of my favorite studies trying to understand violence and conflict uh, was in India. And it was a study, why is there Hindu Muslim violence in some villages and cities and not in others? And the researcher controlled for everything you could think of under the sun. And ultimately the reason that he could come up with was that the health of civic institutions really mattered. So this goes full circle to what Derek was saying, right? 
the YMCA that you mentioned in your district, right, that's trying to introduce people to different ways to de-escalate conflict, that really matters, right? The strength of, of softball leagues and chambers of commerce and uh, schools and rotary clubs and synagogues and mosques, all these things, they're unusually present in the United States. There are pockets of the country that have become deserts for this. And there, there, there's a map that can show you where those are, right? And that's where we need to focus our resources. But those things really matter when it comes to reducing political violence and helping us know each other across racial divides, political divides, other kinds of divides. Um, so this is, again, a reason why, look, the United States spends tens of millions of dollars supporting the equivalent of the YMCAs in other countries to prevent violent conflict. So why don't we do that here? And I think this is what Representative Kilmer's, Kilmer's bill is trying to do. So I live in Washington, DC, where I do not have a voting member of Congress, but maybe you all uh, can do what you can to support uh, Congressman Kilmer's bill. Thanks for, thanks for letting me uh, join you all tonight, despite not being in Washington state. So, sorry. <laughs> Ms. Ripley, thank you for that. And thank you, Dr. Clayton, uh, and also Representative Kilmer for allowing me to be a part of this conversation with you all. Um, I've learned a lot in the, the hour or so that we've been together. So I really appreciate the, the honest and authentic conversation that we had. And I'm hopeful that uh, perhaps we'll be invited again uh, in this very same platform to, to have a, another conversation and dig in deep. But in the end, while we will talk about the challenges we will always begin and end our conversation with hope uh, because hope is what will continue to keep us moving forward throughout the most challenging of circumstances. So thank you again, panelists. Uh, thank you, Humanities uh, Washington, for allowing us to have this conversation. And I will ask that all of those people who are viewing this presentation's conversation, I will encourage you all to continue to support uh, Humanities Washington for all that they're doing and continue to support all of their future programming uh, that will always center around how is it that we as human beings uh, can live amongst one another in peace. And so we will end this conversation with uh, words actually from one of our uh, viewers, Jill Johnston. So Jill, I'm giving you the due credit. And we will end with, with your words, which are partially from your comments. Democracy requires that all points of views be presented. There are no others. Every voice must be heard, every voice must be respected, and every voice must be honestly considered. And so with that, uh, Jill Johnston, I think you uh, put a fine point uh, to this conversation. So again, thank you to the panelists. Uh, thank you to those who, who stuck with us and, uh, and took part in this conversation. And we look forward to seeing you all at the next event. Take care and peace be with you all.